Tonight on America's Dumbest Criminals, would you recognize a case of picture-perfect stupidity developing before your eyes? He slipped down the duck thinking he was one cool customer, but now he has no place to vent his anger. And we've all taken wrong turns, but this guy's two time zones away from where he thought he was. Here are your directions. Sit tight. We're about to show you the lineup of America's Dumbest Criminals. Now, welcome your host for America's Dumbest Criminals, Daniel Butler and Debbie Allen. Alright. If I gave you 50 bucks, would you let me cut your hair? Huh? Are you out of your mind? No, no, but one of the criminals will be on the show later tonight, apparently is. Well, we're gonna get to a guy later who's the ponytail bandit, all right? But now we've got a story about teenagers who thought that pictures that developed instantly literally came out of the camera fully developed. <laughs> Patience was clearly one of the several virtues these kids didn't have. Not only were they caught on camera, they were caught by a camera. Seeing is believing. <laughs> I was sent to investigate a burglary at a sporting goods store. And when I got there, I was processing the scene and I happened to cross this garbage can behind the counter and, and inside the garbage can is a Polaroid camera. I asked the owner if this was his camera and he says, yeah, it's usually sitting on the counter uh, to take pictures of guns on consignment that he takes in. So I picked the camera up out of the garbage can and underneath the camera are two Polaroid pictures of two juveniles. Look at this guy. We took the Polaroid pictures uh, we come back to the police department, looked it up in the, in the school yearbook, and matched the two pictures up to the, the two juveniles to who broke into the store and went and paid them a visit. And later, while we were talking with the two juveniles, they are telling me that they saw the camera there and, and he, he took a picture of his buddy with it. And it came out gray. He didn't know he had to wait a minute uh, for it to develop. So uh, he thought the camera wasn't working, so his buddy takes the camera and says, well, you just don't know how to do it. So his buddy takes a picture of the other one and uh, he says, yeah, you're right. He says, they're both gray, so they, they throw them in a the garbage can uh, <laughs> to them to realize that Polaroids take a few minutes to develop. And when they were confronted, they, they initially denied it until we showed them the Polaroid pictures of them inside the business, and they couldn't explain it. It's been a long time since I've come across a couple idiots like these. Okay. Girls with guns. I know it sounds like one of those bad drive-in movies in the early 70s, you know, like Big Bad Mama, Chicks with Bix, or Switchblade Sisters, but still, it's a fitting title for our next story. Maybe for the first part, but keep watching as the ladies lose more than their edge. It's tonight's edition of Something to Remember Me By. These uh, two bandits went to rob the local bank, uh, two females wearing wigs. Uh, they exited the bank, went outside, and a citizen watched them. He followed them down. They went uh, down several blocks. We're going to dump their stolen car and get in their own car. When they got down there, uh, the citizen approached them and disarmed one of the females. He then gets the other gun away from the other female robber. And at this point, a, a third subject comes up out of nowhere and uh, asks the citizen uh, to give him the guns that he was going to help him out. He hands the guns over to this female. Turns out this female was actually a robber. Uh, during their hasty retreat, they had to get away. They uh, left their own personal vehicle there, which was registered to the female. Uh, in, the, in the car was uh, two wig boxes, purses with all their IDs, everything that led to the uh, ultimate apprehension of these uh, dumb criminals. You know, in my whole life, I've never looked at an air conditioning vent or an exhaust duct and thought, gee, I bet I could slip through there. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> oh, come on now. What are you talking about? With, with your height, you could jog through one of those and not even bump your head. Daniel, hand. you are not No, well, Tom Cruise did in Mission Impossible. He's short. Watch it. I like him. Okay. But at least you have better sense than our next crook who did, in fact, try to crawl through a duct. And one more sad soul caught in a bind with no way out. Take a look. 
When the staff came in to open the store, they discovered they weren't alone. Sometime in the night, an intruder had become one with their ventilation system. He wanted out. He wanted out. That was his ultimate thing, just get me out of here. Firemen obliged, but undoubtedly getting out was much harder than getting in. Inside the duct, I heard, uh, help me and, and uh, get me out as quick as possible. That's all he was saying. And he was just doing a lot of moaning. He claimed that he entered through this shaft to get away from people who were chasing him. Maybe, maybe not. But one thing's for sure, they didn't find him. Well, it's a shame that, you know, he tried to do that. I mean, he got hurt, but, you know, you get what you pay for. <laughs> At least the guy gets to shift to the considerably comfier constraints of the tight gurney straps. Hey, check out another dumb law. In New York, it's a misdemeanor to arrest a dead man for debt. Well, our next story is about death, sort of. At the beginning of the show, we hinted that we may have found the son of Dracula. You know, the undead offspring of an undead father? <laughs> well, this story isn't quite so creepy, but it is rather peculiar. See what you think. It stakes its claim among America's dumbest excuses. I see a car riding all over the road. He's weaving bad. Pull the car over, and it's right along the highway to the Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, girls crying hysterically when I pull her over. And I said, well, you know, you're driving really bad. You're obviously drunk. She said, oh, no, no, my father just died. I just left the hospital. And she produces uh, one of those visitor passes from the hospital. And, and I said, well, what's that got to do with you drinking? Well, my father died, and I was so upset Went back to the family's house, while sitting around, I had a couple drinks to calm my nerves. I'm not drunk, I'm just upset. I said, okay, well, you can't drive. So she says, I said, you have to call for a ride. She doesn't even have any money for a phone call. I give her the money for the phone call. I dial the phone for her, I hand her the phone, say, call somebody. She's talking to somebody, or supposedly talking to somebody, tells them to come pick her up. Let's tell her, don't drive the car. I leave, I'm sitting at the red light. She doesn't even wait till I leave. She pulls out of the Dunkin' Donuts with her lights out and proceeds to drive up the highway. Pull her over again, I arrest her, take her and the kid in the station, put her on a breathalyzer, she's drunk, and she made a phone call for somebody to come get her. Man's in the lobby to come get her, I have to go out and tell him, you know, she's gonna leave, but you can't let her drive. And asked him who he was, and he said, well, I'm her late father. called her from the great beyond. I wonder if that's a long distance call, Daniel. Oh, yeah. You can bet that cost you more than a dime a minute, Debbie. But every once in a while, we come across a story that isn't really about dumb criminals. It's more about dumb situations. Here's one about two fifth graders in love. But when one gives the other a peck on the mouth, they end up in a bushel of trouble. It's our kinder, gentler version of a blue light special. Another scandalous relationship hits the press. And no, it didn't take place in the White House. It's Atlantis Elementary. David and Ashley, two fifth grade students, were suspended for a day because they were kissing in the school hallway. And the two lovebirds were barred from going on a chorus trip to Tallahassee. Later, the school board reversed its decision and allowed the couple to go, but only if their parents would chaperone the trip. David, did you or did you not have relations with that woman? Any comments? Oh, my, everybody stopped staring at me and stuff. Oh, my God. Ashley? Let us go back to Tallahassee, like, forget about the whole thing and just drop it. The student handbook says that students who engage in public affection may be suspended only after being warned first. I said, you're making it sound like my child and David has got some kind of disease of some sort and you're displacing them from the other children. In the end, the kids did go on their trip. They're back in school and all is well with the world. A little bit later, we're going to meet the secret agent man of Suffolk County, New York. But now with news from a guy who puts the anchor in Anchorman. Here's Daniel with ABC Headlines. I'm touched.
You know, motorcycle helmets are generally considered valuable safety devices, but they weren't so good at protecting the anonymity of this stick-up artist at an Austin pizza parlor. The robber hid his face behind the headgear, but apparently forgot that both his nickname and full legal name were boldly emblazoned on the side of the helmet. <laughs> Tommy, rail splitter, you know. Here's the story of a thief who was willing to work for his loot. A man was disappointed with his take when robbing a Topeka convenience store, so he tied up the clerk and worked the counter himself for three hours <laughs> to increase his plunder. Sensing something was not right, police nabbed the guy before he called it quits. I think it was shortchanging people, I'm not sure. A company in Arizona called Guns for Hire stages gunfights for Western movies and special events, but they received a request for an event that was not only special, it was illegal. A woman, believing them to be an association of hitmen, inquired about having her husband killed. They turned her down and then turned her in. So she won't be riding off into the sunset anytime soon. And that closes the file on ABC headlines. News ripped from somewhere near the back of your local newspaper. Debbie. <laughs> what happens when you mix the fairy tale of Rapunzel with the story of Samson and Delilah? You get the escapades of a mixed up man who is obsessed with the idea of cutting off a woman's ponytail. Watch this hairy, scary look at a very strange crime. Do you have any idea what this is? No, it's not your ordinary bag of hair. It's a severed ponytail chopped from the head of Anita Rayner. And she kept pulling on it and pulling on it. I thought she was just trying to readjust my ponytail or something. I didn't know she was readjusting it in that fashion. The culprit found his victims by calling hair salons and conning stylists into cutting off the ponytails of innocent customers. We've kind of taught the receptionist he's just kind of got a strange fetish, hang up on the guy. Um, we never thought anything would actually come from it. Except a bag of hair or two. After this hair-raising experience, Anita filed a restraining order against the ponytail bandit. Something needs to be done with this man. I mean, he, he's out on bail right now. Is he making more phone calls at his house? I mean, he should be in jail right now. And how does Anita feel about this ponytail bandit? He's a weirdo. He's sick. He has urges, <laughs> you know, who knows? What other kind of urges does he have? Mm, only his hairdresser knows for sure. But life goes on for Anita. She still has her pride and a big bag of hair. Okay, smoking pot is illegal. Driving under the influence of anything that turns your brain into silly putty is stupid. But here's a fella who just kept off the grass, but he's getting ready to be mowed down. It's a tidbit we call, I'm where? You're who? Well, recently while on patrol, I was in a two-man unit and pulled up to a red light at Sahara and Maryland Parkway. This white van pulls up to my right. I casually glance to the right, make eye contact with the driver. He makes eye contact with me. I think nothing of it. Light turns green, we start to drive away, and this guy is obviously in some kind of hurry. The van pulls away at a high rate of speed. It peels out, takes off. I look over at my partner, say, Joe, let's uh, follow this guy. He continues to accelerate. Speed limit's 45. I start following him at his speed. Get up to 75 miles per hour. This gentleman's weaving in and out of traffic, and I'm like, okay, you know, I've got enough probable cause to stop you now. The trooper hits the red lights. He just continues to go. I follow him for about a half mile with my lights and siren on behind him. It's like he doesn't see us or doesn't want to see us. Finally, he pulls over. Uh, Joe exits the police car and goes up and makes contact to the driver. He was nervous from the very beginning. Start talking to him, tell him why I stopped him, and while I'm talking to him, I start to detect the uh, smell of marijuana. Why don't you do me a favor? Why don't you step out of the car real quick for me, please? So I get him out of the vehicle, I handcuff him. So I ask him, you know, quite bluntly, sir, is there any marijuana in the vehicle? He looks at me, kind of with a confused look on his face, like he's kind of sh shocked that I asked. And he says, well, you might find a joint in the ashtray. And I glance down in the ashtray, and right there in plain view is, an, is a joint. At that point, I ask him again, well, sir, now I'm going to look in the vehicle quite extensively. Am I going to find any drugs in the vehicle other than that joint? Yes, sir. Okay. 
He says, you got anything else in the car? He says, yeah, well, you might find a pound of marijuana in the center console. I might find it. You're not sure? In fact, that was the case. He had just bought a pound of marijuana. Well, I'm standing back at the car and looking face to face with this guy, and he's got this real sad look on his face. And I kind of looked at him and said, that's why they call it dope. He looked at me and just dropped his eyes, and that was it. We thought it was kind of funny that uh, he would do that right in front of a police car and after looking at us, but I guess uh, that short-term memory loss uh, was cut down to about 20 seconds in this case. I'll admit, I'm not always great about following directions, and sometimes I have a tough time with a road map, but I have never, ever been as confused as this guy. See what I mean? I work in San Diego, but I'm originally from Texas. I lived in Houston and several of the suburbs between Houston and Galveston. So one day I come up on this person on the side of the roadway who appears to be asleep behind the wheel, but the motor's running and they're just sitting there with their hands on the wheel and knock on the window and he stomps on the brake and grabs the wheel real quick and realizes we're out there. Well, he's a real strong odor of alcohol. So I get him out of the car and I start asking questions that we always ask people that we suspect may be under the influence of alcohol. And I said, well, where were you drinking? And he says, well, friend's house. Well, all of a sudden he starts giving me answers that he's, he's in Houston. I said, well, where do you think you are now? And because we're under an overpass where you can't really see, he says, well, I think I'm on southbound 45, uh, somewhere between Houston and Galveston. So through a series of questions, we narrow it down to exactly what off-ramp he's on on the freeway between Houston and Galveston, Texas. So I give him, ask him a few more questions and then eventually you know, decide he's under the influence of alcohol and arresting. And I said, well, now, I'm sorry to tell you this, sir, but you're not in Houston. You're in California. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I'm in California, sure. He says, well, you see the patch on my shoulder here? It says California Highway Patrol. He says, yeah, sure. Uh, I, now I got it. My Coast Guard buddies put you up to this. You're not even really a law enforcement officer. I said, no, buddy. Not only am I a law enforcement officer, but you're under arrest for driving under the influence. You're in California. Well, he didn't believe me. Well, I show him the side of the patrol car. It says Highway Patrol on it. It says there's no Highway Patrol in Texas. It's the Department of Public Safety. Uh, what had happened was he was being shipped from Galveston to Houston. He had driven straight through, lost a lot of sleep there, stopped over to get a, several drinks, and completely forgot what state he was in. So we go to the jail. Well, he actually had to see three separate deputies that said San Diego County on their shoulders before he even believed him. Remember the song Secret Agent Man? Sing a little remember? bit more. Secret Agent Man. Great you tune. Know? Recorded by Johnny Rivers. I think it hit the top of the charts in the spring of about 1966. What? Who are you? Casey Kasem? <laughs> no. But working with you, it just pays to be on my toes. Yeah, well, that's not going to make you that much taller. Ah, I think you were talking about Secret Agent Man. Yes, yes. Well, it seems that our crook loved that song, but in a very strange twist of fate, that tune caused him to expose his own secret. His story is a prime suspect for we're not making this up. One of the dumbest things I ever saw a criminal do was about a year and a half ago I was on a surveillance on a case, a credit card case. Um, it was kind of a, like a quiet uh, location, there wasn't much going on. Kind of bored, I cranked up the AM FM radio and I got one of the local radio stations. A guy got on the radio station and he um, made a request. He said, hi, uh, this is Thomas Georgievich, and I'm working as a security guard right now, and uh, I'm kind of bored watching the, the janitors clean up here, and I feel like I'm a secret agent when I'm doing this. Can uh, you play secret agent? And I said to myself, Thomas Georgievich, Thomas Georgievich, Thomas Georgievich, Thomas Georgievich. He says, I know that name. I said, one of the guys is looking to arrest Thomas Georgievich for a bunch of warrants. We've been looking for Thomas for a while, haven't been able to find him, and that's got to be him. So I went back to my office, I got a picture, went over to the state office building, and there in a security guard uniform was Thomas Georgievich, the guy we've been looking for for about six, seven months. Yeah, you know, what are the chances of that happening? Definitely not as great as the chance that we'll be back here next week. Oh, I wouldn't miss it, and I hope you'll make plans to be here, too. We've had fun tonight, but beneath the laughter, there's a very serious point to be made. Any crime is a dumb crime. For goodness sake, for one week, stay out of trouble, <laughs> huh? We also want to commend police officers like the ones you've met tonight. They do such a great job, and we want to say thank you for their tireless efforts. 
But now I think it's time for us to retire for the evening. But don't fear, there's more dumb to come next time. If you've got a lead on the story or just can't wait till next week for more state-of-the-art stupidity, visit our website at www.dumbcrimes.com. As always, we hope that we've all learned from others' mistakes. But if you haven't, we just might see you next week on America's Dumbest Criminal. Goodbye.